Our second scripture today is from Paul's letter to the Galatian church. Chapter 5, verses 1, and then 13 to 25. Verse 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And then verse 13, For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the spirit, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. How many of you watched the Democratic debates this past week? Most of us. Most of us. There was lots of discussion, both before and afterwards. But afterwards, it was who did well, who didn't do well, who should be leaving very, very soon, who shouldn't have been up there in the first place, who showed themselves as serious contenders for the Democratic nomination. There was one candidate in particular that got lots of discussion on social media and, indeed, in the comedy circuit. That was Marianne Williamson. Now, I knew her name before. I knew, at least I was aware of her books. I've never read one. I'm aware of the circuits that she moves in as a person, but I really didn't know very much about her. And like many people, I wondered, why in the world is this woman running for president? What does she think she brings to the table? And, and who's taking her seriously enough that she was one of the ones that, they, that still made it, one of the 20 that still made it to the debates. After the debate, she became the brunt of many, many jokes. Her one comment that she would defeat the power of the current president's hate by the power of love drew the most disdain. And I have to admit, when she said it and I was watching it, we, we devoted it because uh, I was not able to watch it at the time it was on. But um, when I heard that, I chuckled. I chuckled. And thought to myself, what a naive, silly thing to say. Now, in this sermon, I'm not going to be talking about the presidential race. I'm not going to be talking about which candidate I support, or which one you should support, or which one anybody should support. That's obviously not the purpose of this sermon. I'm glad to share my ideas about that if you want to ask me privately. But there was something that really jumped out at me in that statement, and, and that's what struck me. It struck me that had Jesus or Paul been up there on that stage, they very well have made some, say, said something very, very similar to that. I have said in more sermons than I could count, 
The power of God's love overcomes even the most elemental of powers in the universe, even the very power of death. Nothing can stand against the power of God's love. If I really believe that stuff, why in the world would I chuckle a candidate, whisper to myself regarding his or her naivete when they propose to marshal the power of love to change the politics of a nation? Why in the world didn't I see how those two things really ought to connect to one another? Today's passage raises the power of love as the central determining factor in the behavior and the ethic of people who claim to follow Jesus. Now, Galatians is one of the more radical books in the New Testament. Um, one of the more radical books in the Bible. It, it, it's crazy how it says things that, that still cause issues for us in society. Still. Here it is. Paul is talking about love as being this primary organizing principle for people who call themselves Christians in a world where love was anything but a primary organizing principle. Power, influence, finances, even efficacy were questions people asked about why they should do something or not do something. Nobody asked the question, is this the loving thing to do? I would bet that question was never once spoken by Caesar. Never once. Even about his immediate family, let alone about the subjects in the Roman Empire. It simply was, wasn't a question that ever would have come to the table at all. And yet, here, Paul in this letter really tells us this is the central question for us as people of faith. And he works out the implications of that in a variety of ways. In chapter 3, we read one of those radical statements that all of us know. In Christ there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. And he says this in a world that saw those distinctions as indelible features of the universe as things you didn't even question, because they just were. And Paul says, not anymore. Not anymore. We're Christians. We don't care if you're a Jew or a Greek, if you're a slave or free, you, those distinctions are all gone. And gender, doesn't matter. We don't care. God doesn't care. It's gone as an issue. Indeed, we still struggle with some of those questions, don't we? I've seen in the last couple of weeks that the Southern Baptist Convention is having a big kerfuffle over questions of gender, yet again, still fighting about a passage that Paul raised how many thousand years ago. He talks here about freedom, that freedom is based on the ethic of love as its primary characteristic, rather than subservience being the way we live. And indeed, that would have been the primary way people figured out how they interacted in the world. They would have looked at someone to figure out, are they above me on the pecking order or below me on the pecking order? And that lets me know how I behave. And instead, Paul saying, no, that doesn't matter. The only question you ask is love. It is the defining character, characteristic of the Christian law. He says, it is the sum of all of the law. All of God's requirements for human beings are all bound up in that one statement. Is it loving? It is the very power of God at work. It is the identifying characteristic of the followers of Jesus. It is the preeminent evidence of the presence of the Spirit of God. And as the song says, and Paul would agree, they'll know we are Christians by our love. No other issue 
They don't care about your theology. They won't know whether you really follow Jesus by that. They won't know whether you really follow Jesus by how serious you are about learning the scripture. If you can recite the whole of the Bible, if you aren't loving, you're not really where you need to be. I forgot to tell Greg. I've got a cartoon up there, Greg. Can you put it up? You'll see it right there after, after freedom. Yeah. The difference between you, between me and you is you use scripture to determine what love means, and I use love to determine what scripture means. Just leave that up there. That brings us back to Marianne Williamson again. And I think there's no way that we as people of faith can disagree with her, at least her implication, that the role of love is central in that most complicated, necessary, and human endeavor which we call politics. Politics. Now, if we look at the cartoon again, you notice that Jesus there uses the word. The difference between you is me, me and you is you use scripture to determine what love means. I use love to determine what scripture means. Scripture wouldn't have been a word that he would have used. Indeed, it wasn't a word that Paul used. You remember what Paul used in that passage we read when he says, the whole of the scripture? No, the whole of the law is summed up in love. And then later on he says, and against such things, the fruits of the Spirit, there is no law. He uses that term both referring to the laws of faith, the, the Bible, the Scripture, but also to Roman law when he says against such things there is no law. He was talking to people who lived under Roman law. Now, all of this stuff is making me very uncomfortable. It's making me very uncomfortable because it is a political passage. And it felt like a political Sunday, in, in the small p, political at least. And, and I'm a good Baptist. You know, my, one of my most cherished and, and deeply held Articles of faith is the separation of church and state. And, and when we were having trouble with our community here about the safe parking program and, and whether or not we should be allowed to have parkers here, I said something before the city council that could have gotten me in a lot of trouble, and I think they were just kind. It wasn't very smart, but it was true. I said, you can't tell us what we're going to do because we're a church. Well, I'm sure that more than one of them kind of went. <laughs> but I believe that. And, and, and I believe that's part of what uh, separation of church and state means. That the government can't define what the church's ministry is. But the other side is equally true. That churches, people of faith, can't impose their faith on other people. You can't put sectarian things in law. Simply that. You can't do that. And, and, I, and I don't know that Paul would have necessarily disagreed with that, but we can't put sectarian ideas in the law. Just, you can't do that. But Paul's words still ring true. By contrast, the fruit, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. That's actually a matter of contention right now in some places. But all of us can agree there ought not to be a law against such things. And Marianne Williamson got me thinking about all of that. She is not my candidate. I'll just put that out there. If, she, if she's yours, that's, that's fine. I'm, I'm not saying she shouldn't be. I'm just, I want you to know I'm not endorsing her and saying any of this. She got me thinking. And, and, and after, after I stopped chuckling at her and, and thinking about how naive she is, 
I started to ask what I think is the right question for us as people of faith. What might our policies look like if we dare to shape them by love? What would our country look like if our first order of question is, what is the loving thing? What is the loving thing? And, and I don't mean wishy-washy sentimental love, but the real get down in the dirt and work it out love. Not the easy, fluffy questions. The real, sometimes very difficult, often very complicated questions. But what does love say to us about such things? What does love say to us about immigration? It's clear it does not say put children in cages. That's, that's simple. And anybody who says it does mean putting children in cages, there is nothing left to talk about with that person. It's that simple. But it still is a very complicated set of issues. And it's not simple to just say, oh, let's be loving about it. What does that mean? How do we work that out? Wouldn't it be wonderful if some of our politicians asked that question? What is the most loving thing to do for our own people in this set of questions, for, for our international relations, and for those people who are coming to our borders? What does that look like? What's the most loving thing to do about health care policy? Showing love to someone obviously does not allow us to set up a system where some people have no access to health care. It simply is not loving. And if you tell me it is, I, I have nothing to say to you. There's nothing left to talk about. You can't set up a system where some people are excluded or where others risk bankruptcy and having their entire lives fall apart just because they got sick. But that doesn't answer the question, okay, then what do you do? It's easy to say what you don't do. Now, what does love say you do? We live in a nation where gun violence is worse than anywhere else in the world. What common sense gun laws does love call us to lift up? We have an entire generation paralyzed by educational debt. How does love address that question? We have growing inequality in our country about distribution of wealth, where the top 1% holds more wealth than the bottom, bottom, 80%. How can that be loving? And it's exacerbated by race. I saw a study this week that just it, it, it made me shake my head, and, and I didn't know what else to do. They said they were looking at different cities around the country and, and looking at race in those cities. And they went to Boston, and they did a survey to figure out what the median net worth was for a white person in Boston. Okay? It was $247,500. Okay? That was the median net worth of a white person in Boston. So half the white people had more, half the white people had less. Do you know what the median net worth of a black person born in the United States was in Boston? Are you ready? This is not a mistake. Eight dollars. Eight dollars. I would bet almost all of us have more than $8 in our pocket. And if we don't have $8 in our pocket, it's because we don't carry money anymore. And most of us here probably consider ourselves middle class. $8 as the median net worth. That's insane. It's absolutely insane. What does love call us to do to begin to address these issues of, of financial inequality? Now, I don't know about you, but after the 08 election, I was feeling pretty good about the state of race relationships in the United States. I, I knew that racism was still there. I mean, come on. There was nothing else going on with the whole birtherism stuff except racism. 
It, it, it was simple. It was still there. But it felt to me like we had made, we'd, we'd, made a, we'd gone around a corner. We'd made a big jump. We had said, you know what? Yeah, we still have people who, who don't get it. But we have enough people in our nation, again, I, and I'm, I'm not talking about policies, but enough people in our nation who said, yeah, we're not going to let a person's race stop us from voting for them. We had enough people around at that point to say, yeah, we can elect a black man. But then came the 16 race, and since then, and racism has pushed itself to the forefront again in ways that I thought were long gone. And to see people marching around carrying Nazi flags and making statements about race openly and having their faces shown just struck me as so sad. Back in Pennsylvania, I, I had my heart drop as we were driving down a road and came across a huge Confederate flag. Alexis just said two, I missed the second one. And I thought, who in the world is bold enough to stick their racism right out there for everybody to see? I thought we had been past that. What does love say about the legacy of racism, about slavery, about Jim Crow, about a penal system that sends such a large percentage of African American men to prison rather than to college? What does love say? Our world has had five previous mass extinctions. The worst one was 250 million years ago at which time 96% of the marine species and 70% of land species went extinct. Can you imagine that? Now, under normal circumstances, the, the, the people who study such things say that, yeah, things go extinct, but it's pretty rare, and they go extinct at about the same rate that new species evolve. So, in a normal lifetime of a person, you might see one species go extinct. That's when things are normal. Things aren't normal. And we find ourselves coming at a situation where we're really looking at yet another, a sixth mass extinction. And everybody agrees it's being caused by human beings. How does love call us to respond to that? 97% of climate scientists agree that climate change is a real crisis caused by human activity and that we are getting perilously close to a tipping point after which there will be no way to address the issue. And the world will change in ways that we cannot imagine if we don't do something immediately. And, and we see hints of that. This week, the highest temperatures ever recorded in Europe were recorded. These folk in Europe who don't think, oh, we don't need air conditioning, and now it's hitting 114 in France. And they're going, maybe we need air conditioning. <laughs> Floods destroying, destroying farmlands in the Midwest. And I don't know about you, but I am more than a little bit nervous about what the fires are going to look like this year and when they're going to start. How does love call us to respond to what may be the largest existential problem ever faced by humanity? What might we be being called to do? What does love say in all of these very, very difficult questions? What does love call us to do? What does it call us to be as we respond as people of God?
as followers of Jesus? It, they're hard questions. They're hard questions. And it is political. Now, I could go on raising these difficult issues as that face us as a society. Because there are lots more of them. We could go on. It could get really depressing, couldn't it? That face us as a society, as a nation. And, and the questions are real. And I think good old Marianne Williamson, she put the onus on those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus. What does it mean to say that love is our primary motivator. How do we address all of these questions? And again, I'm not saying any of them are simple. Indeed, if they were simple, we would have solved them a long time ago. But what changes about our discussion as people of faith if we come in and say, yeah, but is that the loving thing to do? Is that the loving way to address this problem? Is that the loving answer to a very difficult question? How do we address these political questions? And, and, and one piece that, you know, I, that strikes me very clearly when I, I hear people say, well, you know, we doesn't have to follow those same, so, same parameters of behavior because it's a government. Well, and you might be able to argue that in some situations, but we live in a place where, uh, as I understand it, it is government by the people, of the people, for the people, that our government is us. And, and so whatever our government does is a reflection on us as individuals. And so it is our responsibility to say, no, this is what I believe is right, or this is what I believe is not right, and here's how we need to go. What might it look like if we really did take Paul seriously and say, what's the loving thing? What's the most loving thing in this difficult and complicated situation? And how does that play itself out?